So welcome to this webinar on FAIR data. Uh, it's the first in a series of three and it's aimed at increasing your awareness of FAIR and uh, providing approaches with which you might be able to make your own data and software approaches fairer. So the first webinar will focus on the F and A aspects of the FAIR acronym, whilst the second will provide information on the I and R elements of FAIR. And the third webinar will be a much more hands-on approach where we will um, uncover how the BioDevil RDC projects can be made more fair. Um, and so a quick introduction. Uh, I'm Frankie Stevens and I'm going to be your presenter today. Um, also in the webinar, as mentioned, uh, my colleagues Andy, who kind of kicked us off. Uh, Andy's your local project contact uh, from the ANS team. We've also got Martin uh, Schweitzer on the on the call and uh, Martin has been uh, working with us on this material and will be presenting the next webinar. And we've also got Keith Russell from the ANS team who's actually the Partnerships Program Manager and who's uh, joining us as an expert moderator on FAIR. Um, so we actually anticipate that this webinar was probably going to run a, a little under an hour, uh, which you'll appreciate no doubt. Uh, so without further ado, I'll get going. Um, we'll start with a little video that actually sets the scene. Could you hear the sound on that? No, we can't. No, okay, so I think I need, oh Andy, uh, when we start the uh, Zoom meeting, there's an option to select uh, share with sound. Did you by any chance click that one? I don't recall that option. Okay. Um, so there that... are subtitles, so we can maybe just... Go with that, yes, yeah. it's probably less painful than the voices anyway. <laughs>
Okay, so the problems encountered by the panda in the previous video would actually be far fewer if research was more open. Uh, open research not only benefits individual researchers, but society as a whole. It opens up research to the general public, it promotes collaboration, increases transparency and reproducibility, increases the visibility of researchers' work, fosters good scientific practice, and allows existing data to be reanalyzed and repurposed. And as you can see from this slide, there are a number of benefits to open data and open research as a whole. And these range from the researcher focused increase in citations and credibility, through to addressing the challenges currently encountered in research reproducibility, and enabling better linkages between academia and industry. At its most basic, it avoids unnecessary duplication effort and allows the data to be repurposed. And data reuse is an efficient way of encouraging new discoveries. But uh, some data could be freely available, but completely illegible, uh, so to speak. And this is one of the problems that FAIR data seeks to address. So what is FAIR? Uh, they're principles that were designed by a diverse set of stakeholders, representing academia, industry, funding agencies, and scholarly publishers. And these stakeholders all came together to design and jointly endorse a concise and measurable set of principles to address how best to enable data reuse. And the principles aim to bring about a change in modern research communications through the effective use of information technology. And the intent is that these may act as a guideline for those wishing to enhance the reusability of their data holdings. The FAIR principles put specific emphasis on enhancing the ability of machines to automatically find and use data, in addition to supporting its reuse by individuals. And the principles have actually received international recognition since they were drafted by that group and uh, broadcast by Force 11 in 2015, and uh, they were published in a Nature article in 2016. Uh, so what are they? They are guiding principles for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable research data. So FAIR is obviously an acronym. And there are a few things that are of interest regarding the principles. They look at making research data reusable, not only by humans, but also by machines. And this has the advantage of making data harvestable for big data approaches, so pulling in large amounts of data and enabling pattern recognition and new innovative processes for knowledge discovery across large and varied volumes of data. And the principles are also intentionally uh, technology agnostic. Uh, the principles have been written with any research discipline in mind and have been formulated in a way that they can be applied across various disciplines. And the principles address both the data and the associated metadata to enable optimal reuse. And they're not just about the data. Making something fair requires underlying infrastructure, sometimes policies, procedures, guidelines surrounding not just the data, but tools, platforms, and software in use. So making something fair necessitates a little understanding. And hopefully you're going to get that today. Uh, so some would argue that not all data is suitable to be made open or, or even fair in the end. Um, as researchers are running experiments and huge volumes of data are coming off instruments, the raw data will not always be kept. And for working on scratch data, it doesn't always make sense to keep this and make it fair. Uh, another such example is where the data has been produced in a project which was jointly funded with business partners or if there are commercial interests in the data. There might not be an interest uh, to have any part of the data or the research discoverable, unfortunately. And the same may apply for national security or defence research. And there may be cases in which the data can't be made open for very valid privacy reasons, for example, when it contains information that can identify individuals and contains other sensitive information, uh, such as pinpointing the location of threatened species that uh, smugglers may want to get hold of. Um, and it's important to note that just because data isn't open, it doesn't mean it can't be fair though. So data can still be fair, but be kept under mediated access controls, so it isn't open. In some of these examples, it can make sense to make the metadata about the data collection open and describe how a user can get access to the data, and that would still count as fair. So what else is fair not? Uh, it's not related to the legal terms that are in use in copyright law for fair use and fair dealing. 
neither is it the FAIR data mark, and it's not a standard, it's an acronym. So we're now going to look at each individual principle in more detail, starting with findable. But findable can be summarised by data and metadata being easy to find by both humans and computers. Uh, with these principles, where you see brackets around the word meta, that means that the principle is applicable to both the data and the metadata. So starting with F1. Uh, so metadata and data are assigned a globally unique and eternally persistent identifier. Identifiers in this case means a link on the internet, for example, a URL that results to a web page that defines the concept such as the information on a particular human protein. And we'll come back to that example link later in the webinar. F1 stipulates two conditions for your identifier. The first is that it must be globally unique, which means that someone else couldn't reuse or reassign the name identifier, the same identifier, without in so doing referring to your data. You can obtain globally unique identifiers from a registry service that uses algorithms guaranteeing newly minted identifiers are unique. And the second is that it must be persistent. It takes time and money to keep links active on the web, and over time links tend to get broken. And registry services guarantee to some degree the resolvability of that link into the future. So F2, uh, metadata, that's data about data, and we'll come to that in a bit. Metadata should be generous and extensive. So you should include descriptive information about the context, quality and condition or characteristics of the data. And rich metadata allow the computer to automatically accomplish routine and tedious sorting and prioritizing tasks that currently demand a lot of attention from researchers. F3, uh, identifiers and rich metadata descriptions alone will not ensure findability on the internet. Uh, perfectly good data resources may go unused simply because nobody knows that they even exist. If the availability of a digital resource such as a data set, service or repository isn't known, then no one and no machine can discover it. And there are many ways in which dig digital resources can be made discoverable, uh, including indexing. Uh, F4. Metadata and the data set they describe are actually usually separate files. Now, the association between a metadata file and the data set should be made explicit by mentioning a data set's globally unique and persistent identifier in the metadata. Many repositories will generate globally unique and persistent identifiers for deposited data sets that can be used for this purpose. And here are some links to where you might find resort, more resources on Findable. Um, and we'll be sharing a PDF of these slides with you so that you can follow up on these in your own time if you need to get more information from these resources. So moving on to accessible. Uh, to be accessible, A1, data and metadata are retrievable by their identifier using a standardised communications protocol. So both the data and the metadata should be accessible. Now using the identifier, for example, a DOI, a handle, a persistent URL, and, and we'll come to all of these later, you should be able to get to the data, and not only as a human, but also as a machine. And examples of such protocols are HTTP or FTP. Um, A1.1, to maximize data reuse, the protocol should be free, so that's zero cost, and open, as in open sourced, and that's globally um, implementable to facilitate data retrievable. It should not be bespoke, home-built and badly documented, and it should not require some specialised expensive software. Um, A1.2 is actually an often misunderstood part of FAIR data. Um, accessible does not necessarily mean open, but rather it gives the exact conditions under which the data are accessible. So even heavily protected and private data can actually be FAIR. And if FAIR is well implemented, a human can see that the data isn't open, but clearly can see what steps they need to take to get access to the data. And this could be as simple as being presented with the name, email address, phone number of the custodian of the data. It could also include, for example, a clear description of the ethics approval process they need to go through to get access to the data. And as the FAIR principles also look at making data reusable by machines, 
If a machine is looking for the data, the machine should be able to recognize that the data isn't open. It can then let the human know what steps they need to take to get access to the data. And if the user, be it human or machine, has been granted access to the data, then the data should be accessible through an authentication and authorization procedure. Um, A2, there are cases in which data have to be destroyed. And this is of course not ideal, but could actually occur, for example, if consent for use was only for a limited period of time, or there's been a legal takedown notice that the data provider has had to comply with. And if the data is no longer available, then the metadata at least must be kept and made available. And this will allow anybody or any machine looking for the data to actually find out that the data is no longer available. And so here are some links to where you might find more resources on accessible. And you'll notice thing 19 there near the bottom uh, mentions APIs. And you may be wondering where APIs fit into the picture. And you'd be right to question this. Um, we've actually opted to further discuss APIs next week when we talk about interoperability. But there are obviously links uh, to APIs with accessibility too. In fact, there's actually a bit of crossover on many of the approaches taken for many of the fair elements. So that's why uh, next we're going to talk to you about kind of what, what's needed to uh, make something fair and, for, well, in, in this particular instance, findable and accessible. So we talked about identifiers. First of all, what is the problem that persistent identifiers are trying to address? So everybody will be familiar with this. You click on a web link that takes you either to a page not found error page like this one, or to content that's actually unrelated to the link you clicked. And both usually happen because a web resource has been moved to another location and you've got the old link. And from a research perspective, this means that a scholarly resource, which may have been cited, can't be found, verified, and potentially cited again, and so on. So this is the problem that persistent identifiers are here to address. And many data repositories will automatically generate globally unique and persistent identifiers to deposited data sets. And identifiers are essential to human machine interoperation and play a vital role in enabling data sharing. And finally, uh, identifiers will also help others to properly cite the work when they're reusing the data. So a persistent identifier is simply a long lasting reference to a digital resource. So even if the resource moves location on the web, the persistent identifier is there to make sure that the link always resolves. So if a PID is used as a citation link in research literature, it will always resolve to information about the resource, either a descriptive metadata page, the resource itself, or information about the removal of the resource from the web. So it's important to note though that PIDs do not guarantee a link will never be broken, but they create a technical and a social framework which, which actually helps to, to guarantee it. Um, PIDs play a key role in the discoverability, accessibility, and reproducibility of research. So how do they do this? Well, PIDs play a role in linking scholarly resources, such as publications and data, as well as tracking the impact of these resources. They provide social and technical infrastructure to identify a research output over time, and they enable machine readability. They enable research objects to be labeled uniquely and disambiguate one object from another. And they facilitate the linking of research projects, related people and things, so that a person may discover a publication, its related data set, related software, related methods, and so on. So let's look at the handle system as an example of a PID. Most PIDs for research work by separating the identity of a scholarly object from its location on the web. And handles are run by the Corporation for National Research Initiatives, or CNRI, in the US. And CNRI is a not-for-profit organization formed in 1986 to undertake, foster, and promote research in the public interest. The handle system is very robust and is widely used internationally among repositories. And importantly, it also provides the underlying infrastructure for digital object identifiers, which we'll come to shortly. So what are uh, handle characteristics? Uh, there's a central handle registry where handle identifiers are recorded. The model is one where you assign one handle per resource. 
There's a distributed computer system, including handle proxy servers. And there's minimal cost, and this is usually borne by the handle issuer, such as an institution running a handle proxy server. And they're unique, global, scalable, and reliable. But remember, PIDs are both technical and social infrastructure. So if the URL of a resource changes, then the owner must update the URL in the handle system. So the handle system is mainly made up of a suffix that identifies the local name of the resource, a prefix that identifies the naming authority, and a resolver service such as hdl.handle.net. Um, so let's look at another example of persistent identifiers, and that's digital object identifiers or DOIs. Um, as mentioned, there's an, there are an implementation of the handle system, and you can see that they actually have a very similar structure. And these originated from the scholarly publishing industry. And DOIs are routinely assigned by publishers to identify journal articles and other published works. And there's a great deal of uh, technical and social infrastructure invested in DOIs. And according to some research, they're by far the most widely uh, used persistent identifier for research objects, which includes research data. So DOIs are applicable to a variety of digital objects in research. So that can be publications, data, software methods, theses, and so on. Um, and they're governed by the International DOI Foundation, which is uh, another not-for-profit organization. And DOIs are used by a, uh, issued even, by a DOI registration agency or their agents, and ANS is actually one of these. Um, there can be a cost associated with DOIs, but some agencies, such as ANS, uh, offer a free service. And with ANS, you can actually get a DOI through the ANS service, either through manual or machine-to-machine -machine minting. Um, and as for handles, DOIs are unique, global, scalable, and reliable. They also actually come with a metadata package. And here's an example of a DOI metadata schema, in this case, the data site metadata schema. And this is a set of mandatory metadata that must be registered with the data site metadata store when minting a DOI for a data set. And the domain agnostic properties were actually chosen for their ability to aid in accurate and consistent information of data for citation and retrieval purposes. Uh, you can see that there are certain properties here that are mandatory, recommended, and then optional. Uh, but why do we need all of these metadata attributes, and uh, what is metadata? So the most widespread definition of metadata is that metadata is information about data, or data about data. Um, there is another way to look at it that's uh, different to that rather dull dis description. Um, Jason Scott actually sees metadata as a love note. It might be to yourself, but in fact, it's a love note to the person after you or the machine after you, where you've saved someone that amount of time to find something by telling them what this thing is. Um, so describing physical and digital objects is what metadata is about. It helps the classification, access and storage of all types of digital assets. It's with metadata that the encoding of knowledge within any data element is possible. And metadata comes in many shapes and flavors, carrying additional information about where a resource was produced, by whom, when the last time it was accessed, what it's about, and so on. Um, some would say that there are three main types of metadata, a descriptive, structural, and administrative metadata. So descriptive metadata adds information about who created a resource, and most importantly, what the resource is about, what it includes. Structural metadata includes additional information about the way data elements are organized, their relationships and the structures that they're in. And administrative metadata provides information about the origin of resources, their type and the access rights. And metadata elements grouped into sets designed for a specific purpose, for example, for a specific domain, are called metadata schemas. And we showed you uh, a minute ago what the data site metadata schema was. And metadata schemas that are developed and maintained by standard organizations, such as ISO, or organizations that have taken on the responsibility, for example, the uh, Dublin Core Metadata Initiative, are actually called metadata standards. Um, but the problem with standards is that there are so many of them. 
um, across the research disciplines, there are thousands of standards and several thousand databases where resources are kept. Um, and as consumers of these standards and databases, it's often very difficult to know which resources are the most relevant for a specific domain. Uh, fair sharing is an, it's an educational resource and information resource uh, on standards, databases and data policies. And the fair sharing team works with and for the community to map the landscape of community developed standards. Um, so I would recommend having a look at fair sharing to discover metadata standards applicable to your domain. But bear in mind that fair sharing isn't the only resource for this. Uh, in much the same way that there are thousands of standards, there's also more than one place that collates these resources. And we've provided a link there on the slide to a nice digital curation center resource uh, that you can investigate also. So being able to describe and identify the data is one thing, but this is less useful if nobody can discover it. So we've already spoken about why it's useful to reuse research data. It enables secondary data analysis on the data and it enables reproducibility among lots of other good reasons. Um, those are just a couple of the examples of why uh, people go looking for data. But here are just a few examples of where people go looking. So um, Google, of course, who doesn't uh, always hit up Google first. Uh, asking a colleague for data is also very common. Uh, checking out project websites or disciplinary resources is another avenue. But the two that we're going to touch on in a little bit more detail are the Generalist Research Data Australia, uh, RE3 data, and we'll talk about some biospecific repositories as well. So starting with Research Data Australia, or RDA. So RDA is an ANS operated service which enables you to find, access and reuse data for research. Um, RDA has metadata records of data assets from over 100 Australian research organisations, government agencies and uh, even cultural institutions. So getting your data registered in RDA increases its chance of discovery and therefore reusability. And I'm sure you're all familiar with Research Data Australia, so I will not labour the point here. Uh, Re3data.org uh, is a global registry of research data repositories that covers repositories from dis different disciplines. It presents repositories for the permanent storage and access of data for researchers, funding bodies, publishers and scholarly institutions. And Re3data.org promotes a culture of sharing, increased access and better visibility of uh, research data. And the registry went live in 2012 and is funded by the German Research Foundation. Uh, we also previously touched on fair sharing with respect to their metadata standards capabilities, but they also hold information on databases. And this slide also uh, presents uh, some links to bio-specific resources. Um, GEO, for example, is a public uh, functional genomics data repository. Uh, array and sequence-based data are accepted in GEO. And tools are also provided to help users query and uh, download experiments and curated gene expression profiles. Uh, so Array Express, in uh, particular the archive of functional genomics data, stores data from high-throughput functional genomics experiments and provides these data for reuse by the research community. And finally, on this slide, we're going to mention Elixir, um, which has compiled a list of resources that it recommends for the deposition of experimental data. Um, the scientific community, community actually has a shared responsibility to ensure long-term data preservation and accessibility. And these deposition database lists actually help researchers and others involved in the life sciences to enable this. So we'll now take a little time to discover how a life science resource can actually be made more fair. And in this example, we're looking at Uniprot. The Uniprot is one of the world's largest uh, freely available biological data resources, providing key life science data in the most open and accessible manner to the scientific community. All entries are uniquely identified by a stable URL, that provides access to the entry in a variety of formats, including a web page, XML, plain text, RDF and REST services. So this helps achieve findability and accessibility of the resource. 
um, interlinking with more than 150 different databases. Every UniPro entry has extensive links into, for example, PubMed, which actually enables rich citation. And these links are key to the user experience in human and machine readable formats. This helps with interoperability, which we will definitely cover in more detail in the next webinar. And the entries contain rich metadata that's both human readable through HTML and text formats and machine readable through XML and IDF. And again, this helps with the findability of the resource. And whilst we will uh, cover more on interoperability and reuse in our next webinar, all UniPro representations use shared vocabularies and ontologies such as Go and Eco, which help metadata descriptions for both interoperability and findability. Uh, the RDF representation uses the UniPro RDF schema ontology in Faldo, which actually helps with interoperability and reusability, as we'll cover next week. So that actually brings us uh, close to the end of our first webinar affair, and we hope that we've kind of covered the topics of findable and accessible uh, relatively comprehensively. But to verify this, uh, we'd kind of like you to do a quick online quiz for us, if that's okay, so that we can potentially also modify this training material for future use if uh, needs be. So if you could please open up the link that you see on the slide, and I think Andrew is going to be pasting that into the chat box, um, and take just a couple of minutes to answer the multiple choice questions. It's really not onerous, I promise. But uh, once you've hit submit, come back to Zoom where we'll uh, answer any questions you may have on F and A, and then wrap up the webinar. By the, uh, the videos, I'm not sure that anybody needs any more time than, than been given already. Um, so let me shift the slide to the next one, which just says questions, actually. But um, yeah, does anybody have any questions on the material that we've actually covered today? Because uh, Andy, Martin, myself, and Keith are raring to uh, answer them. I want to say thank you. It was presented very well, and it was quite clear. So. Well, that is lovely to hear. Thank you. I have a question and a comment. And as well, I want to say that was great. It was very, very good. I thought that was very useful. Um, I guess I had a question on resolving or what happens when organisations or projects and, for instance, the Devil Project will be copying some reference data sets from places, from databases that are, you know, will be listed in things like the Elixir deposition databases. So, you know, things from Ensemble or from, you know, one of the big European databases and we'll have a local copy of it in, you know, in the, in the virtual lab. Um, and then I guess my question is when, you know, I guess one of the things we're thinking about is definitely ensuring that we have much better provenance metadata associated with our copy, you know, making sure that it's clear what the identifier was, where we sourced it from, when we don't downloaded it, et cetera, et cetera. I guess my question is about resolving to, you know, either to a copy or to the original source. What, what, what's your, do you have any thoughts or around that? Um, so if people came to our resource and were effectively accessing the copy, um, but when we were talking about potentially, you know, reuse of data, would, would it be good to resolve to our copy or to the original copy? So my thinking on this is that you would resolve to your copy. Um, and I guess we might explore this a little bit further in the, in the workshop. But um, and if, if you're going to, because over time your copy might differ to the original copy and it depends on whether you're going to keep the, the two always in sync or not. So there could be the possibility that in the future um, the, the two may be out of sync. And then if people want to reference, um, you know, for, for reproducibility reasons, um, a, a particular copy, then at least they know that the copy you have is 
the one that relates to what they've used or what they've reused. So that would be my thinking on that. But I'm, I'm happy to, to hear from Keith, Keith or? Yeah, so Jeff, I think, um, uh, I think for one thing it would be great if, if at the other end um, uh, they mint a DOI for that data set and you can just point to that and that would be the place to point to. Uh, the big question and risk is indeed, uh, is that really a, a reference, a stable reference data set or is there a risk that that would change? If you are taking a subset or you're taking a version that's, that uh, uh, for some reason might differ from the, uh, the data set up, up in Europe, then I'll definitely make a copy and then um, if it differs, then you need an own DOI for your own data set. And for provenance reasons and for tracking what's happened to create that data set, it would be good to have a trail that says, okay, this is my data set, this is perhaps the DOI for my local data set, but it is re it, it's been derived from this data set, which has this DOI. And that, that's where the real benefit of DOIs comes in, is that you can always, that should always resolve back to the original data set too, because that's the responsibility at the, was it the EMBL end, uh, the European end. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, thanks. I, I guess we we tend not to pick and choose from data sets. We we would tend to take a specific data object that doesn't change. So I guess that makes life easier. And and these things are just like the the um, the protein, the uniprot thing that you showed. I mean, they don't necessarily have. DOIs, in fact, none of them have DOIs, but they have persistent identifiers that, you know, have been around for 30 years and at least have a URL. So, yeah, thanks. And, and the general principle around all persistent URL, uh, persistent identifiable, globally unique by persistent identifiers, is that if, if there already is a, if somebody has already minted an identifier for that, to point to that rather than creating a new one, if it really is the same data set. Yeah, great. Data object. That makes life easier.